I have the announcement in case number 11393, National Federation of Independent Business versus Sibelius, and the related cases. In these cases, we consider claims that Congress lacked constitutional power to enact two provisions of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010. The limits on government power, foremost in many Americans' minds, are likely to be affirmative restrictions, such as contained in the Bill of Rights. These affirmative restrictions come into play, however, only where the government possesses authority to act in the first place. And in our federal system, the national government possesses only those limited powers the Constitution assigns to it. If no constitutional power authorizes Congress to pass a certain law, that law may not be enacted, even if it would not violate any of the express prohibitions in the Bill of Rights or elsewhere in the Constitution. The first provision at issue here is often referred to as the individual mandate. That provision requires individuals to maintain a specified level of health insurance. For many, the mandate must be satisfied by purchasing health insurance from a private company. Those who do not obtain the required coverage owe the IRS what the Act calls a shared responsibility payment. The question is whether Congress has the constitutional power to enact the individual mandate. The government advances two arguments that it does. First, the government contends that the Constitution's Commerce Clause authorizes the mandate. Second, the government says that Congress could enact the statute under its constitutional power to lay and collect taxes. Turning first to the Commerce Clause. Congress has never before attempted to use the commerce power to order individuals not engaged in commerce to buy an unwanted product. And nothing in the text of the Constitution suggests it can. The Commerce Clause allows Congress to regulate commerce. The power to regulate commerce presupposes the existence of commercial activity to be regulated. Our precedent reflects that understanding. As expansive as our cases construing the commerce power have been, they all have one thing in common. They uniformly describe the power as reaching activity. It is nearly impossible to avoid the word when quoting our cases. The individual mandate, by contrast, does not regulate existing activity. It instead compels individuals to become active in commerce by purchasing a product they do not want. The government contends that Congress can do this because the failure to purchase health insurance has a substantial effect on interstate commerce. In particular, the government focuses on the cost that the uninsured as a group impose on the health care system when they need care but are unable to pay for it. Allowing Congress to regulate individuals precisely because they do not do something, however, would vastly expand federal power. People, for reasons of their own, often fail to do things that would be good for them or for society. Those failures, joined with the similar failures of others, can have a substantial effect on interstate commerce. Under the government's logic, that authorizes Congress to compel unwilling citizens to act as the government would have them act. Congress already enjoys vast power to regulate much of what we do. Accepting the government's theory would allow Congress the same license to regulate what we do not do. That would fundamentally change the relationship between the American citizen and the federal government. Now, to an economist, perhaps, there is no difference between activity and inactivity. Both can have measurable economic effects on commerce. But the distinction between doing something and doing nothing would not have been lost on the framers who were practical statesmen, not academic theorists. The framers gave Congress the power to regulate commerce, not to compel it. For over 200 years, this Court's decisions and Congress's actions have reflected this understanding. There is no reason to depart from it now. But the government says that health insurance is different because everyone will eventually need health care. According to the government, that means the uninsured, even though doing nothing, can be, quote, regulated in advance. That assertion is inconsistent with a limited conception of federal power. The Commerce Clause is not a general license to regulate an individual from cradle to grave simply because he will predictably engage in particular transactions. The government also contends that Congress could enact the individual mandate because the mandate is important to other parts of the Health Care Act. 
Other provisions of the Act, whose validity under the Commerce Clause is not challenged here, restrict the ability of health insurance companies to charge higher prices to less healthy individuals. Those provisions will likely cause insurance companies to raise the prices they charge everyone. According to the government, the individual mandate is, in the Constitution's language, necessary and proper to support those provisions because it will compel healthy individuals to subsidize the cost of insuring those who are less healthy. Our cases interpreting the Necessary and Proper Clause have been very deferential to Congress's determination of what is necessary. But we have also explained that the clause is not a grant of a great and independent power. The clause only allows Congress to do things that are incidental to the exercise of its other powers, Compelling people to enter commerce precisely because they have chosen not to cannot be considered a necessary and proper supplement to the Commerce Clause. There are separate writings on this subject, but a majority of this Court agrees that the Commerce Clause cannot sustain the individual mandate. That brings us to the government's second argument, that the mandate may be upheld under Congress's power to lay and collect taxes. The government's tax power argument asks us to interpret the statute not as ordering individuals to buy insurance, but rather as imposing a tax on those who go without it. Under the mandate, if an individual does not buy health insurance, the only consequence is that he must make an additional payment to the IRS when he pays his taxes. The government says that means the mandate can be interpreted as establishing a condition, not only health insurance, that triggers a tax the required payment to the IRS. Under that theory, the mandate makes going without insurance just another thing the government taxes, like buying gasoline or earning income. And if the mandate is just a tax hike on taxpayers who don't have health insurance, it may be within Congress's constitutional power to tax. Under our precedent, if there are two possible interpretations of a statute and one of those interpretations violates the Constitution's the Constitution, courts should adopt the interpretation that allows the statute to be upheld. Thus, the question here isn't whether the interpretation of the statute the government offers to support its tax argument is the best interpretation. Rather, under our cases, the question is whether that interpretation is reasonable or fairly possible. If it is, then the court should adopt that interpretation rather than declare the statute unconstitutional. The payment the Act imposes on those without health insurance certainly looks like a tax. By its terms, it applies to taxpayers and is paid to the IRS when they file their tax returns. It doesn't apply to individuals, individuals who don't pay federal income taxes because their income is too low. For taxpayers who do owe the payment, its amount is determined by factors such as taxable income, number of dependents, and joint filing status and the payment is expected to generate nearly $4 billion per year in government revenue. The Act doesn't call this payment a tax. It calls it a shared responsibility payment and a penalty. But whether a law is within Congress's taxing power is determined by what the statute does, not the labels Congress attaches to it. This payment functions like a tax. It's paid by taxpayers with their taxes to the IRS and will generate a lot of government revenue. The amount of the payment also suggested is, in effect, a tax. Our cases examining whether something is a tax often consider this factor. If an exaction is so high that no one could be expected voluntarily to pay it, that can show the law is really just a command enforced by a fine. The payment in this case, by contrast, is calibrated to the taxpayer's income, can never be higher than the cost of buying insurance, and can often be quite a bit less. It is indeed likely that many Americans will choose to pay the IRS rather than buy insurance. And someone who makes that payment has fully complied with the law. He has not done anything unlawful. The Solicitor General confirmed that understanding in his briefs and at oral argument. That is another reason that this statute functions more like a tax than the sort of punitive exactions we've struck down before. The plaintiffs, however, say that because this statute uses words like shall and penalty, the law must be read to make it illegal not to buy insurance, even if that would mean the law was unconstitutional. We disagree. An example may help show why. Suppose Congress enacted a statute providing that every taxpayer who owns a house without energy-efficient windows must pay $50 to the IRS. 
The amount due is adjusted based on factors such as taxable income and joint filing status and is paid along with the taxpayer's income tax return. Those whose income is below the filing threshold need not pay. The required payment in the hypothetical statute is not called a tax, a penalty, or anything else. Now, no one would doubt that this law imposed a tax and was within Congress's power to tax. Now suppose Congress used the word penalty to describe the payment. The law would still do the exact same thing. There is no reason to conclude that it would then be outside Congress's power to tax. The plaintiffs also argue that even if the tax is interpreted, even if the statute is interpreted as a tax, such a tax would violate the Constitution's direct tax clause. But as our opinion explains more fully, our precedent is clear that a tax on going without health insurance is not a direct tax. Still, this tax is a burden that the federal government imposes for an omission, not an act. If the commerce power does not authorize Congress to regulate those who don't engage in commerce, perhaps the taxing power should not permit Congress to impose a tax for not doing something. But we cannot accept that reasoning. First and most importantly, nothing in the Constitution guarantees that individuals may avoid taxation through inactivity. The government's Commerce Clause argument asks this Court to condone a new sort of federal power, ordering people not in commerce to buy an unwanted product. The government's tax power argument, by contrast, asks us only to determine that Congress has done something it clearly can do and indeed often has, use tax incentives to encourage people to buy a product. Upholding the statute under the taxing power does not recognize any new federal power. It determines that Congress has used an existing one. Moreover, Congress's ability to use its taxing power to control conduct is significantly weaker than it is under the Commerce Clause. When Congress regulates under the Commerce Clause, it can bring the full weight of the federal government to bear. A command issued under the Commerce Clause can be backed by fines, imprisonment, and all the consequences of being branded a criminal, such as loss of job opportunities, the right to bear arms, or vote in elections. By contrast, Congress's authority under the taxing power is limited to requiring an individual to pay money into the Federal Treasury. That is, of course, no small thing, but our cases have always maintained that a tax so punitive that it functions like a command exceeds Congress's taxing power. The Affordable Care Act's requirement that certain taxpayers pay the government for not obtaining health insurance is, in effect, a tax on those without insurance. Passing on the wisdom or fairness of such a tax is not our role. Because the Constitution permits it, we must uphold it. In sum, a majority of the Court holds that the Federal Government cannot use the taxing power to order people to buy health insurance. But a majority also holds that the statute here may be upheld as a tax increase on those without health insurance, which is within Congress's power to tax. So this portion of the Affordable Care Act is upheld. We now turn to the second part of the Act challenged in this case, often referred to as the Medicaid expansion. Enacted in 1965, Medicaid offers federal funding to states to assist needy persons in obtaining medical care. In order to receive that funding, states must comply with federal rules governing matters such as who receives care and what services are provided at what cost. The Affordable Care Act dramatically increases state obligations under Medicaid. The current Medicaid program requires states to cover only discrete categories of particularly vulnerable individuals, pregnant women, children, needy families, the blind, and the disabled. There is no mandatory coverage for most childless adults and parents receive aid only if their income is far below the federal poverty line. The Medicaid expansion, in contrast, requires states to cover all individuals under the age of 65 with incomes below 133 percent of the federal poverty line. And, critically for this case, if a state does not comply with the Act's new coverage requirements, it may lose not only the federal funding for the expansion, but all of its federal Medicaid funds. The Constitution's Spending Clause grants Congress the power to pay the debts and provide for the general welfare of the United States. Our cases have recognized limits on Congress's power to use the Spending Clause to compel the states to advance federal objectives. One of the fundamental tenets of our Constitution 
is that the states are independent sovereigns, not merely departments of the federal government. Our cases thus make clear that Congress cannot commandeer state governments to carry out federal programs. That is true whether Congress directly commands a state to run a federal program or indirectly coerces a state to adopt a federal program as its own. Normally, the way for states to avoid complying with conditions on federal funds they do not like is to refuse to take the money. The states are separate and independent sovereigns. Sometimes they have to act like it. The Medicaid expansion, however, is far from the typical case. Congress did not merely condition the new funds for impl implicating, implementing the expansion on whether states agreed to expand their Medicaid programs. Instead, Congress threatened to withhold states' existing Medicaid funds if they do not comply with the expansion. The states claim that this threat serves no purpose other than to force unwilling states to sign up for the new program. We agree. There is no valid reason to condition a state's existing Medicaid funds, which are already being spent according to federal conditions, on agreeing to the new program. We examined a similar situation in a case called South Dakota versus Dole. There we did not strike down the federal law, but only because the amount of money at stake was so small, less than one-half of one percent of South Dakota's total budget. Under those circumstances, we held that the threat to withdraw funds was, quote, relatively mild encouragement, so that whether to accept the federal funds and conditions remains the prerogative of the states, not merely in theory, but in fact, end quote. In this case, the threat to withhold funds is more than relatively mild encouragement. It is a gun to the head. A state that opts out of the Medicaid expansion stands to lose all of its existing Medicaid funding. The threatened loss of over 10 percent of a state's overall budget leaves a state with no real option but to accept the Medicaid expansion. The government, however, claims that the Medicaid expansion is just a modification of the existing program. It observes that the original law contains a clause expressly reserving the right to alter, amend, or repeal any provision of the Medicaid program. But the Medicaid expansion is a shift in kind, not merely degree. Under the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid is transformed into a program to meet the health care needs of the entire non-elderly population with income below 133 percent of the poverty level. It is no longer a program to care for the neediest among us, but rather an element of a comprehensive national plan to provide universal health insurance coverage. A state could hardly anticipate that Congress's right to alter or amend the Medicaid program included the power to transform it so dramatically. We thus reject the government's argument that the states agreed to this when they signed up for the original Medicaid program. Threatening to withdraw states' existing Medicaid funds if the states do not accept the expansion is an impermissible attempt to conscript states into the federal bureaucratic army. Although there are separate writings on this, this issue as well, seven members of the Court agree that the Medicaid expansion violates the Constitution's limits on the spending power. Nothing in the controlling opinion precludes Congress from offering federal funds to states to expand their Medicaid programs. What Congress cannot do is penalize states that decline to participate in that new program by taking away their existing Medicaid funding. The Medicaid ruling does not affect other provisions of the Affordable Care Act. States now have a real choice whether to accept the Medicaid expansion. That may affect the implementation of the Act going forward, but for reasons we explain in our opinion, it does not impair the Act's other provisions in such a way that we must invalidate them in whole or in part. The Court today rules that Congress does not have the power under the Commerce Clause to enact the individual mandate. The Court goes on to rule that Congress does have such power under the Taxing Clause. Finally, the Court rules that the expansion of Medicaid in the Affordable Care Act is unconstitutional to the extent it allows the Federal Government to take away a State's Medicaid funds if the State does not adopt the expansion. Our decision today is based on our responsibility, recognized in Marbury v. Madison, to say what the law is. It is not in any way based on our judgment about whether the Affordable Care Act is good policy. That judgment is for the people acting through their representatives. It is not our job to save the people from the consequences of their political choices. The judgment of the Court of Appeals for the Eleventh Circuit is affirmed in part and reversed in part. 
Justices Breyer and Kagan join parts 1, 2, 3C, and 4 of this opinion. Justices Ginsburg and Sotomayor join parts 1, 2, and 3C and concur in the judgment with respect to part 4B. Justices Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito have filed a joint dissenting opinion. Justice Thomas has filed a dissenting opinion. Justice Ginsburg has filed an opinion dissenting in part in which Justice Sotomayor joins and in, in which Justices Breyer and Kagan join in part. As the Chief Justice has indicated, Justices Scalia, Thomas Alito, and I have written a joint dissent. In our view, the act before us is invalid in its entirety. The joint dissent is organized this way. First, it considers the constitutionality of the individual mandate, and that, of course, requires a discussion of whether the mandate can be sustained as a valid exercise of Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce or as an exercise of its power to tax. Second, the joint dissent considers the constitutionality of the expansion of Medicaid in light of the argument that it coerces states to surrender the power that must be vested in them under principles of federalism. Third, the joint dissent considers the question whether the Act's other provisions can be preserved if the mandate and Medicare, Medicaid expansion are unconstitutional. First, the individual mandate. Now, the statute requires a defined class of individuals to purchase health insurance. This mandate is first defended by the government as an exercise of Congress's power under the Commerce Clause. It is true that if an individual does not purchase insurance, he or she affects the insurance market to a degree. But the government's theory would make one's mere existence the basis for federal regulation. There would be no structural limit on the power of Congress. As a result, the government's theory would change the relation between the citizen and the federal government in a fundamental way. We cannot accept the government's theory. There are structural limits upon Congress's powers. In other words, there are some things the federal government cannot do. And that clear principle carries the day here. It requires us to conclude that Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce does not give it the authority to enact the individual mandate. This conclusion is supported by five justices, the Chief Justice and the four members of this joint dissent. Now, despite the fact that Congress exceeded its power to regulate interstate commerce when it passed the individual mandate, a majority of the court holds that the individual mandate, if it's recast as a tax, is, con is constitutional. The court unanimously concludes that the individual mandate is not a tax under the Anti-Injunction Act, but five members of the court then pivot and hold that the individual mandate is a tax for constitutional purposes. And to do this, the majority rewrites the statute Congress wrote. We disagree. The act requires the purchase of health insurance and punishes violation of that mandate with a penalty. But what Congress has called a penalty, the court calls a tax. What Congress called a requirement, the court calls an option. And where Congress mandates that the person shall obtain insur insurance, the court says he may but need not obtain insurance. In short, the court imposes a tax when Congress deliberately rejected a tax. Judicial tax writing is particularly troubling as a usurpation of the legislative rule. It places the power to tax in the branch of the government least accountable to the citizenry. But the Constitution requires taxes to originate in the House of Representatives, the legislative body most accountable to the people. There, elected officials must weigh the need for the tax against the terrible price they might pay at their next election. Imposing a tax through judicial legislation inverts the constitutional scheme. In the case of the Affordable Care Act, Congress went to great lengths to structure the mandate as a penalty, not a tax. But the majority now says that it is a tax, at least for the purposes of sustaining it, although not for the purpose of jurisdiction. As to the Medicaid expansion, the second part of this joint dissent considers the Medicaid expansion. The expansion provides new funds to the states for Medicaid. Its whole design is to threaten withdrawal of all of a state's federal funding for Medicaid if the state does not comply with the expansion directive. Now, in, in so doing, the Medicaid expansion leaves states with no realistic choice but to expand Medicaid and to participate in the expanded program. It coerces them into administering a federal program against their will. 
that blurs the line of political accountability between the states and their citizens. The coercion affected by the statute is a violation of state sovereignty, and on this threshold question of coercion, seven justices agree. Three justices, however, devise a remedy that, again, in effect, rewrites the statute and changes its design. And in a separate opinion by Justice Ginsburg, joined by Justice Sotomayor, uh, these two other justices conclude that the Medicaid expansion is valid as written, but in view of the disposition of the Chief Justice, they then agree with the remedy he adopts. This joint dissent disagrees. We find no judicial authority to rewrite the statute to permit this remedy. The design of the court's remedy, contrary to the statute Congress enacted, is to bar the federal government from withdrawing all pre-existing Medicaid funding if a state elects not to participate in the Medicaid expansion. Once the specifics of today's ruling are understood, it will be apparent that the Affordable Care Act now must operate as the court has revised it, not as Congress has designed it. And the consequences of that result are as follows. The court offers states a choice where Congress wanted them to have no choice. And to make matters worse, the choice the court offers may be illusory. That is because even if a state elects not to accept the expansion, its citizens are still subject to the individual mandate. Now recast as the tax. But now in those states, the cost of the insurance that must be purchased may well be far higher for insurance companies have no Medicaid expansion to help defray the cost of insuring unhealthy individuals at unprofitable rates. This distorted version of the act is now decreed by the court and no one else. It is the position of the joint dissent that the Medicaid expansion cannot be saved in this way and that the expansion must be declared invalid. The third and final part of our joint dissent considers severability. What to do with the remainder of the act if the individual mandate and the Medicaid expansion are unconstitutional. In our view, both those provisions are central to the Act's design and operation, and all the Act's other provisions would not have been enacted without them. It must follow that the entire statute is linked together, and without the mandate and Medicaid expansion, the entire Act is inoperative. Now, the joint dissent addresses at some length the question of severability for two reasons. First, it's necessary for us to address severability in order to support the conclusion that, in our view, the Act is invalid in its entirety. Second, our analysis of the Act's many interdependencies gives further support for our conclusion that the Court's Medicaid remedy is itself inconsistent with the Act. The analysis and the severability part of the joint dissent makes clear that what the Court has done is to force on the nation a new Act so that the health care system is now governed by what the court has said, not what the Congress has said. The fundamental problem with the court's approach to the case is this. It saves a statute Congress did not write. The court regards its strained statutory interpretation as judicial modesty. It is not. It amounts instead to a vast judicial overreaching. It creates a debilitated, inoperable version of health care regulation that Congress did not act and the public does not expect. The Court's disposition, invented and atextual as it is, does not even have the merit of avoiding constitutional difficulties. It creates them. The judgment on the Medicaid expansion issue ushers in new federalism concerns and place, places an unaccustomed strain upon the Union. Those states that decline the Medicaid expansion must subsidize by the federal tax dollars taken from their citizens vast grants to the states that accept the Medicaid expansion. If that destabilizing political dynamic, so antagonistic to a harmonious union, is to be introduced at all, it should be by Congress, not by the judiciary. The values that should have determined our course today are caution, minimalism, and the understanding that the federal government is one of limited powers. But the court's ruling undermines these values at every turn. In the name of restraint, it overreaches. In the name of constitutional avoidance, it creates new constitutional questions. In the name of cooperative federalism, it undermines state sovereignty. We must submit with due respect that today's decision somehow overlooks this court's historic role and responsibility to teach, to, to confirm, to insist upon this proposition 
the Constitution, though it dates from the founding of the Republic, does and always must have powerful meaning and vital relevance in the context of our own times. And this case presents real questions regarding the structure of the Constitution. Some may think a case concerning constitutional structure with issues concerning checks and balances, separation of powers, and federalism is somehow of lesser importance or priority than a case concerning liberties guaranteed in the Bill of Rights or the Civil War Amendments. But structure means liberty. For without structure, there are insufficient means to hold to account a central government that exceeds its powers in controlling the lives of its citizens. Today's decisions should have vindicated, not ignored, these precepts. For these reasons, we would find the act invalid in its entirety. With respect, we dissent. In the 1930s, Congress responded to the need of senior citizens for old age and survivor's insurance. It did so by making Social Security a tax-based, entirely federal program. In 2010, Congress addressed the public's need for affordable health care when sickness or injury occurs. Congress did so by taking a path unlike the one it took for Social Security. Instead of an entirely federal program, the Affordable Health Care Act gives states and private insurers important roles in ensuring medical care for those who need it. The question the Court must answer is whether the Constitution stops Congress from taking the course it did. I would answer emphatically no. I agree with the Chief Justice that Congress's power to tax and spend supports the so-called individual mandate or minimum coverage provision. But I would make that an auxiliary holding. As I see it, Congress's vast authority to regulate interstate commerce solidly undergirds the affordable health care legislation. I would uphold the legislation first and foremost on that ground. Since 1937, this Court has deferred, as it should, to Congress's policymaking in the economic and social realm. Today, a majority of the Court rules that the Commerce Clause is not equal to the task. That ruling harks back to the era ended 75 years ago when the Court routinely thwarted legislative efforts to regulate the economy in the interest of those who labor to sustain it. It is a stunning setback. It should not have staying power. The Court's majority would compare health insurance to any other commodity, broccoli, for example. If the government can compel people to buy insurance, then there is no commodity the government can't force people to purchase. So the argument goes. But health care is not like vegetables or other items one is at liberty to buy or not to buy. All of us will need health care, some sooner, some later. But we can't tell when, where, or how dire our need will be. A healthy 21-year-old, for example, may tomorrow be the victim of an accident that leaves him or her an invalid in need of constant and costly medical care. Further, to get broccoli, one must pay at the counter, not so of health care. The accident victim who cannot pay the steep price of medical services will nevertheless receive emergency and follow-up care because the law and professional ethics so require and because ours is a humane society. But people who do purchase insurance end up footing the bill by requiring the healthy uninsured either to obtain insurance or pay a toll. 
Congress sought to end this free ride. It is short-sighted, moreover, to see the mandate as a decree, decree that the hale and hardy young people subsidize care rendered to older, less healthy people. In the fullness of time, today's young and healthy will become society's old and infirm. Viewed over a lifespan, the costs and benefits even out. And as I just observed, the youth who does not want insurance today may find that tomorrow she desperately needs the services insurance is designed to secure. What the mandate does essentially is to require people to prepay for medical care through insurance instead of waiting, expecting to pay out of pocket at the point of service when in reality many will lack the money to cover the cost. The Chief Justice reasons that Congress can use its commerce power to regulate something already in existence but cannot create that something in order to regulate it. But the interstate health insurance and health care markets are not Congress's creations. Both existed well before the enactment of the Affordable Health Care Act. I have already emphasized the unique attributes of the health care market, the fact that all of us will be in it sooner or later and cannot predict exa exactly when, the huge free rider problem caused by people who refrain from purchasing insurance, then become sick or injured, and get care cost-free to them, but costly for those of us who have paid in advance. Because there is no comparable market, the slippery slope envisioned by the court's majority, if health insurance today, then broccoli tomorrow, is far more imaginary than real. As a learned jurist once commented, judges and lawyers live on the slippery slope of analogies. They are not supposed to see it to the bottom. Yes, the insurance purchase mandate is novel, but novelty is no reason to reject it. As our economy grows and changes, Congress must be competent to devise legislation meeting current-day social and economic realities. For that reason, the Necessary and Proper Clause was included in the Constitution to ensure that the federal government would have the capacity to provide for conditions and developments the framers knew they could scarcely foresee. In enacting the Affordable Health Care Act, Congress's aim was to reduce the large numbers of U.S. residents, some 50 million in 2009 who lack health insurance. Congress was aware that the vast majority of those people lack insurance not by choice. One group of particular concern to Congress were individuals with pre-existing medical conditions. Before the Affordable Health Care Act's enactment, the insurance industry charged these individuals steep prices or flatly denied them coverage. Congress understood, however, that a simple ban on those practices would not work. Without the mandate to acquire, to acquire insurance, covering those with pre-existing conditions would trigger a death spiral in the health insurance market. Many people would not buy insurance until they suffered sickness or injury. Premiums would skyrocket. More people would be added to the ranks of the uninsured because they could not pay the steep premiums. And eventually, insurance companies left with a pool of high-risk policyholders would exit the market. With the mandate, the job could be done. Access to insurance would be available and affordable and uncompensated care would be hugely reduced. In no way was Congress's action improper. The mandate acts directly on individuals. It does not commandeer the states as intermediaries. And along with other provisions of the Act, it addresses the sort of 
countrywide problem that made the Commerce Clause essential. The crisis created by the many millions of U.S. residents who lack health insurance is hardly contained within state boundaries. Far from encroaching on state prerogatives, the Affordable Health Care Act supplies a federal response to a need the states, acting separately, are incapable of meeting. This Court has long recognized that the power to regulate interstate commerce is an affirmative power commensurate with national needs. While the Court upholds the mandate, as it surely should, it also, regrettably, hems in Congress's commerce power. In doing so, the Court invites assaults on national legislation irreconcilable with the framers' anticipation. Their understanding and expectation was that the Commerce Clause would empower Congress to act in all cases for the general interests of the Union and also in those instances in which the states are separately incompetent. My dissent from the Court's retrogressive reading of the Commerce Clause is joined by Justices Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. There is a further issue. Congress's expansion of Medicaid to include a larger portion of the nation's poor. Medicaid is the prototypical example of federal-state cooperation. Rather than authorizing a federal agency to administer a uniform national health care system for the poor, as Congress did in establishing Medicare for seniors, Congress offered states the opportunity to tailor Medicaid grants to their particular needs so long as they remain within bounds set by the federal law. Congress reserved the right to alter, amend, or repeal any and every provision of the Medicaid Act, and participating states, for their part, agreed to amend their Medicaid plans consistent with alterations in the federal law. From 1965 until 2010, states regularly conformed to amendments expanding Medicaid, sometimes quite sizably. The 2010 expansion is different in kind, the Court concludes, 7 to 2. Justice Sotomayor and I strongly disagree. According to the Chief Justice, the expansion was misnamed. It did not expand Medicaid as it existed in 2010, he maintains. Instead, Congress established a wholly new program alongside old Medicaid and coerced the states to accept new Medicaid by threatening them with loss of funds from the old program if they hold out. On this reasoning, the Court for the first time ever, finds an exercise of Congress's spending power unconstitutionally coercive. In truth, however, Medicaid is a single program with one constant aim, to enable poor persons to receive basic health care when they need it. What the expansion does is simply this. It adds more people, all of them poor, to the Medicaid-eligible population. Congress did not otherwise change the operation of the program. The Chief Justice justifies his characterization of the expansion as a new program on three grounds. First, he says, by covering those earning up to 133 percent of the federal poverty line, the expansion, unlike Medicaid as originally enacted, does not care for the neediest among us. The expansion covers individuals earning less than $15,000 annually. Those low earners on any fair assessment rank among the nation's poor. Second, the chief observes that newly eligible people receive a level of coverage less comprehensive than the traditional Medicaid package. But the Affordable Health Care Act did not introduce the less comprehensive package, 
Since 2006, states have been free to use it for many of their Medicaid beneficiaries. Third, the reimbursement rate for participating states is different. True, but that rate is markedly more generous than the usual federal contribution, hardly something the states can complain about. The federal government picks up 100 percent of the tab initially, gradually reducing to 90 percent. Suppose Congress had, from the start, made Medicaid eligible all those originally covered plus those added by the expansion. That would be unobjectionable under the Chief Justice's reasoning. But we have never held that a grant program becomes two rather than one when Congress lays a foundation and later builds on it. Congress can and often does expand programs, adding new conditions that grant recipients must meet in order to continue receiving funds. Our decision, I acknowledge, uh, our decisions have hypothesized that a financial inducement might pass the point where pressure becomes coercion and therefore exceed Congress's spending power. But until today, that prospect has remained theoretical. The Court had found no case fitting the bill. Recall that Congress reserved to itself when it adopted Medicaid in 1965 the right to alter, amend, even repeal any and every provision. This Court long ago explained just what those words mean. They mean Congress retains full and complete power to make such alterations and amendments as come within the just scope of the legislative power. States have not missed that meaning. Each time a state notified the federal government of a change it made in its own Medicaid plan, it certified both that it knew the federally set terms of participations could change and that it would abide by the changes as a condition of continued participation. Today's decision holds that Congress can alter a spending program somewhat, but not too much. We can anticipate bolder challenges than in the past, urging that a congressional amendment goes too far, turning pressure into compulsion. When those challenges arrive, my colleagues may comprehend the wisdom of the observation that conceptions of impermissible coercion premised on a state's perceived inability to decline federal funds are just too amorphous to be judicially administrable. At bottom, my colleague's position is that the state's reliance on federal funds limits Congress's authority to alter its spending programs. This gets things backward. Congress, not the states, is tasked by the Constitution with spending federal money in service of the general welfare. And each successive Congress is empowered to appropriate funds as it sees fit. When the 111th Congress reached a conclusion about the portion of the nation's poor that should qualify for Medicaid, a portion larger than a predecessor Congress covered, the later Congress abridged no state's right to existing or pre-existing funds, for in truth, there are no such funds. There is only money the states anticipate receiving but can scarcely insist on receiving from future Congresses. Seven members of the Court, however, by the argument that prospective withholding of anticipated funds exceeds Congress's spending power. Given that holding, I entirely agree with the Chief Justice as to the appropriate remedy. It is to bar the withholding found impermissible, not to scrap the expansion altogether. This Court has many times explained that when it confronts a statute marred by a constitutional infirmity, its endeavor must be to salvage, 
not demolish the legislation. The Court does that by declaring the statute invalid to the extent it reaches too far, but otherwise leaving the statute intact. Because the Court finds the withholding, not the granting of Federal funds, incompatible with the Spending Clause, Congress's extension of Medicaid remains available to any State affirming its willingness to accept the uncommonly generous Federal grant. So, in the end, the Affordable Health Care Act survives largely unscathed. But the Court's Commerce and Spending Clause jurisprudence has been set awry. My expectation is that the setbacks will be temporary blips, not permanent obstructions. 